Hello, and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast number 2009, the topic is Q&A, and the title is Powerlifting, Three Elite Totals in Six Months While Losing 20 Pounds. Yes, someone has actually done this. <laughs> that is quite a bit, and I'll explain a little bit why and all that, uh, but it's a huge celebration of a, of a long process, and I wanted to share how she did it. The client that did this is Lauren Rutan. She, you can find her, learn more about her uh, on Instagram. She's under the, the name Rutan422, and that's R-U-T-A-N. She's on TikTok as Strong Mom. 422 and her and her husband own Rutan Athletic Club up in Canton, Ohio, which you can find out more about that on their website, just www.rutanathleticclub.com. She is an all around badass in the world of weights. <laughs> She's an IFBB pro in women's physique, national level competitor for Olympic weightlifting, and a regional level CrossFitter. And now, a three-time elite total power lifter across three different weight classes. That is insane. (laughs) Uh, For those who don't know, an elite total is a classification standard for powerlifting, the sport of powerlifting. In powerlifting, you have to perform lifts in front of judges, and they're performed to a certain standard, so that way it's equal uh, for all athletes. You get to attempt, uh, you have three attempts basically in front of judges. You lift your heaviest squat that counts to the standards, the heaviest bench press and the heaviest deadlift. You add those together and it equals what's called a total. An elite total is a standard that less than 2% of competitive powerlifters achieve. That's a rough estimate. Uh, I don't know exact because it's not really a statistic that they keep on a regular basis. It's definitively, definitely less than 5%. The last time I read somebody estimating it based on all the numbers, uh, they have like uh, what's called Open Powerlifting, which is a website that tracks all competitive powerlifters. And you can kind of guesstimate from there if somebody does the calculations how many people have an elite total or not. The last time I read, it was around a 2% guesstimation. So that's one. So less than 2% of competitive powerlifters have one elite total. (laughs) So... What's interesting is the amount lifted across all three lifts to achieve a total is variable. Uh, like that's the standard of how you find uh, how to classify people. You classify them by their total. So not not by individual squat, individual bench, individual deadlift. There are definitely records where people compete to see who has the best of those individual lifts per weight class, but it's when you combine them together, that gives you the total, and that's the thing that is uh, standardized across all weight classes. The idea is they have a calculation and a process to where they try to make the elite total for all weight classes equally hard to achieve. So Lauren has an elite total in the 148-pound class, the 132-pound class, and the 123-pound class. The idea is in each of those weight classes and all the others that it's equally difficult to get the elite total. Uh, That way it's kind of an equal challenge for all competitors. Now, per weight class, per single person, like we said, less than 2% achieve that. She has now had three of those. So that is an insane, insane accomplishment to have three of something that less than 2% of people achieve once. <laughs> uh, that's absolutely insane. There, I don't know actually a list of how many people have, have achieved an elite total because it's so rare. It's not like kept. Nobody keeps that record. Uh, or if they do, it's pretty well hidden because I have no clue. <laughs> and I've been training people for this forever. Uh, so... I know the the list includes Ed Cohen, who is like the goat of powerlifting, so Lauren is in very good company. <laughs> it's extremely, extremely rare. Uh, just so, so, so happy for her. And I wanted to share kind of a little bit of our history of working together and then what we've done to achieve what you can read in the title is three elite totals in six months while losing 20 pounds. Now, Lauren and I have worked together in the past. 
when she first ever got into powerlifting, I coached her and helped her, and we got an elite total in the 132-pound weight class. From there, we switched to competing in aesthetic competitions. So she had competed in women's figure competitions when she was in like early 20s, but hadn't done it since then. And we were working together whenever she was in her 30s now. And I was like, well, you know, you did the you did the powerlifting thing. We got the elite total. What do you want to do next? You want to go into aesthetics? Like, do you want to do like revisit some of that? And she's like, hell yeah! And it was made sense. She could build muscle. Like her body responded very well to building muscle. That typically means it's very hard to get lean, which is the typical. The truth is, somebody builds muscle very quickly. It's going to be hard for them to lose body fat. If somebody is very lean naturally, it's harder for them to build muscle. So there's always a little bit of a give and take. So we competed in aesthetic competitions, and we ended up getting her IFBB Pro Card in women's physique. Now, each of those accomplishments are incredibly rare. <laughs> so I'm going to like say that and then move on as if that's just like, oh, yeah, so-so. <laughs> that's freaking awesome. So again, she got the elite total in the 132 class, less than 2% of power just get that. And then she got her IFBB Pro Card uh, through the MPC, in women's physique, I do not know the percentage for that, but it's probably damn near the same percentage. It's very, very hard uh, to get a pro card in aesthetic competitions. Since then, and along the way, she has had six kids in total. Yes, Lauren has six kids. And then at the end of 2023, we started working together again. And the intent was to get back into the competitive spirit. She had had the sixth child and was wanting to get in better shape. She had competed in a power to meet on her own and surprised herself. She did pretty well, and she's like, man, maybe I could get back into this and really have some fun. And that can be a motivator for her to continue to recover from pregnancy, continue to lose body fat, kind of regain the strength that she used to have. When we started working together, she was around 145 pounds. She found a meet, and in like eight weeks of us starting, she was able to compete in uh, that meet. And during that prep, we focused on tightening and strengthening the abdominal wall. Uh, Post-pregnancy, people will suffer from rectus diastasis, which is the separating and spreading of the ab wall. It's like a thinning out of the ab wall, and that can make you very susceptible to injury. So we had to tighten that in and strengthen the abdominal wall. We also had to strengthen all the muscles around the groin and the hip. Super important. You got to fix and strengthen all that stuff <laughs> and work on a ton of mobility work so we can get into the right positions. Uh, and then we also had to grow her glutes, uh, not only to make them stronger for the main lifts, but also to protect her lower back. The glutes and the abdomen, the ab muscles, help support the lower back. So we want to keep her super, super safe. And in order to do so, we knew that those were key targeted areas were the abdominal wall, the glutes, and then working on mobility and strengthening all the tiny little muscles around the hips and the hip socket so that way she could move in the right positions and her body didn't try to like protect her from certain positions, which actually would have been optimal. However, the body would have protected her if they were weak. So we had to make sure those positions weren't weak. During that prep, she was dieting, and I'll share with you kind of our, our approach for the diet. And at that meet, she ended up doing over a 300-pound squat and deadlift, over 150-pound bench press, and she was able to secure the elite total in the 148-pound weight class. So in the first eight weeks of us working together, we pushed her weights up. I, I, I would have to look back through the notes, but I didn't want to take all that time to do that. <laughs> uh, but she added like 20-some pounds to her squat, 20-some to her deadlift, and a good 10-15 on her bench. So it was a really good initial response because we were eating very structured and consistent. And then the training had a, a consistency to it that was pushing the right buttons, basically targeting the right areas. So we got a really good jump in eight weeks in strength. She got the elite total in the 148 pound weight class. So that gave her her second elite total in that would be her second weight class. We then continued to diet and train. Within another eight weeks, we had dieted down under 132 pounds from the starting weight of 145. She did her second meet, and she was able to register in that one at 132 pounds. And then we achieved, again, another elite total. So that secured the elite total that we did uh, six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, so that was really cool that she was able to come back and get that as well. And we improved her what's called a DOTS score, D-O-T-S, DOTS score. And that is a, a score that you would give to the total 
that a person achieves where you can rank people across all weight classes. So typically in competition, if you're in the 132 pound weight class, you compete against everyone else in the 132 pound weight class, but there isn't a direct correlation to how you would have done compared to somebody in the 165 pound class. Now with the dot score, there is. <laughs> they, they use that score to rank people across all weight classes and say, okay, who's the best regardless of weight class? and then have a ranking system from there. So we were able to increase our DOTS score from the first to the second meet, which is, uh, that's kind of the main goal here because we are wanting to work towards national level competitions and improving our national ranking and people are ranked and by DOTS and you get into national level meets by scoring a certain minimum score on DOTS score. So she was able to bump that up, did great. At that meet, the second meet, the second elite total, she actually weighed 130 pounds. So she was two pounds under the weight class limit. And she felt very strong. So we finished that day and we're like, hmm, <laughs> that, tw- that 123 pound weight class isn't looking too, too far off. Maybe we should try it. So we did. We decided, hey, what the hell? You know, you're, you're this close. You're seven pounds away. Why not try it? We, we have some time. I believe we had six weeks <laughs> where we could... We could diet a little bit of fat off, do some water depletion, and then hopefully still have strength left in the tank to be able to hit the elite total at 123. And she did. (laughs) So it was pretty awesome. So what I want to share in today's podcast is her diet and training along the way from the 132-pound competition to the 123-pound competition. So the diet we used to secure the third elite title in third weight class Because I want people to see what the nutrition and training looks like at this elite of a level. I mean, you're talking about the top 1%. The top 1% of powerlifters in the world is what Lauren is. That's amazing. That's insane. That's incredible. And I want to pause because that way if she's listening to this, that she could take that in. Lauren, you're the top 1%. Oh, that's amazing. (laughs) Absolutely amazing. So I want to share what we did. So that way the listeners can hear what secrets we used. How much time per day it truly took her to do all of the work. And how perfect everything had to be along the way. And what I think is going to be neat is for everyone to hear that there are no secrets. That it didn't take an extreme amount of time. And that nothing was perfect. <laughs> Life is absolutely chaotic when you have six kids. And then also along, the, along those past six months, uh, her and her husband bought that Lauren Athletic, uh, I mean the Rutan Athletic Club. They, they bought the club, kind of developed it, and they're starting a brand new business. Can you imagine having six kids and starting a brand new business? And while wow, achieving three elite totals, losing 20 pounds? I mean, this is crazy, right? The stars didn't align. Lauren shoved the stars in place. <laughs> and that's what I want everyone to hear is... What I would tell Lauren to achieve what she's achieved isn't anything different than I would tell any of my other clients. It takes the same steps. Lauren has been diligent and consistent with everything along the way. She manages as much as she possibly can and she's consistent with what she manages. So not only does she take care of her nutrition, tracking her calories, protein, and timing of her foods, not only does she take care of her training, making sure she never misses a workout, but she takes her supplements on a consistent basis. She manages her sleep as consistently as possible, and she works on controlling her stress levels, which I'm sure there are plenty of. But she's attentive to the big picture of things, but also attentive to each little new ones. The people who have achieved great things that I've gotten to work with, 
it's it's hard to sum up like you know all of them did this and all of them didn't do this you know that kind of stuff but there is a general premise and that is that none of them accept excuses and it's just the finish of effort like none of them have like they run into an obstacle and they say oh you know i can't do it because of this and they stop none of them stop that's the difference they figure it out. They find a way around it. They find a different approach. They, they find a way to address it and clear the obstacle and keep the same approach. Whatever it is, they don't stop at their excuses. They don't, they don't find the obstacle and then say, well, you know, I'm struggling because of this. And then done. Like, that, that's the end of it. That's what most people do. And what happens is, is they work hard, work hard, hit an obstacle. They say, oh, you know, I can't move forward because of this. Uh, that's it then they just keep doing whatever is on this side of the obstacle but surprisingly they're not progressing very much because they're not getting past the obstacle they're not getting to the next level they're not going to the next step that's a main difference that i see in the people i've helped get pro cards in aesthetic sports the people i've helped get elite totals in powerlifting i've helped people across a bajillion categories you can actually go to my website www.birdlinergym.com and see on the homepage a list of clients that i've worked with in all the various categories what has helped them i've helped professional athletes olympic athletes people get you know division one sport scholarships help crossfit games athletes i mean you name it been very grateful very fortunate knock on wood thank you god to work with that like wide array of clients and what has helped them achieve greatness is they never stop they don't stop at the excuse that would be a big thing as you can tell because i'm still rambling about it that i would encourage everyone to think of if you want to achieve more where have you stopped what excuse are you just leaving in place I'd encourage you to address that. Okay, enough leave rambling. Let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, so what I want to do is go through and share how we structured Lauren's nutrition. So I'm going to bring up her uh, journal. Uh, all of my online clients have a, a journal. It's a my, uh, Google Doc. I can just title it My Journal, and then it's with their name. So it's private for them and I. <laughs> and then in the journal, we I discuss notes, review uh, you know lifting videos. We talk about questions they have, do nutrition reviews if they track stuff. I get into their nutrition tracking app, see what they did, give them feedback on that. It's a great way for us to communicate every single week. So what I want to do is, again, share the adjustments and changes that we made along the way so that way you can hear what happened what i want to share is from a 132 pound competition to our 123 pound competition the reason why is because that was the more nitty-gritty of the work to get from 145 to 130 and that was what she weighed at the second competition we had a daily calorie total like range that she had to be within and then we had a protein range that we wanted to be within. So, for example, let's see here. It was training days was 1,800 calories to 2,000 calories. Non-training days was 1,400 to 1,800 calories. If she was hungry, she would eat closer to 1,800. If she wasn't that hungry, eat lower down to the 1,400. Protein all days was 130 to 160 grams, so about one gram per pound of body weight and maybe a little bit more, so one to... 1.1 that area and then sugars was kept under 80 grams of sugar a day so that's what we did to get from 145 to 130 was stayed within those ranges training days 1800 to 2000 calories non-training days 1400 to 1800 calories protein about one gram per pound of body weight sugar 80 grams or less she never missed days i'll tell you that uh I don't, I don't if she missed a day i have no clue i don't remember it and i can't find it on the on the journal <laughs> so pretty good so i'll go in and on her tracking app uh, i believe she used my fitness pal well, on her tracking app i would sign in and look at each individual day and say okay well, what was the calories what was the protein what was the sugar and then i would check and see the distribution of the calories and protein throughout the day make sure it was pretty well spread out and that was it that's all we had to do there was no specification of which foods to eat 
Uh, we, I do want her to eat foods that digest well, that make her feel good, uh, and then also that digest at a rate we want. So if we're eating right before training, we want fast digestible carbs and proteins. If we're eating away from training, we're probably going to do a mixed meal of carbs and fats with a slower digesting protein. And then before bed, we want a very slow digesting meal, so that's going to lean heavier into fats than carbs. And again, with a very slow digesting protein, think of like red meat versus a whey protein powder. <laughs> so we want something that's slower digesting. But she could eat whatever she wanted. We did have to keep our calorie, our sugars down, so she can't just eat a bunch of sugary crap, and nor would she. But the idea is she could have whatever she wanted in regards to, like, carbs. She could have carbs, no issues whatsoever. You're going to find out later that we actually had to increase her carbs to get her weight to go down. Bonkers, but yes. Uh, so we had any carbs she wanted. It could be, you know, breads, bagels, pasta, potato, rice, you name whatever other carbs there are. She could have those. Fats, we want healthy-ish fats, uh, so we're going to aim for like unsaturated fats, so, so that would be uh, various like nuts and oils, and you can do a lot of other things, but there's also some saturated fat, it's totally fine, that would come from like red meat or uh, like eggs, there's there's uh, dairy like products, it's okay to have some saturated fat, saturated fat in general should be about one third of your total fat intake, but for clients... Uh, I, I don't really get too specific about that unless I start to see them having only saturated fats. Then I'll give them some suggestions. Uh, so I do give suggestions to people along the way based on what I see them doing, but I don't give it to them ahead of time because they already have enough to worry about, and those are small nuances. I'll take care of the small nuances, bring them up as needed, but I want them to focus on the bigger picture things, calories, protein, sugars, and the distribution throughout the day. If they cover those things, we're good to go. They're, they're going to accomplish the majority of what they need. So, for example, just with those parameters, training days at 1,800 calories, 2,000 calories, non-training 1,400 to 1,800, protein 1 gram per pound of body weight, sugar under 80 grams a day, she was able to eat enough, eat well, to achieve an elite total at 148 and the elite total at 132. That was all the diet that we needed. Pretty awesome, right? Is to hear that, it doesn't have to be you only can eat, you know, quinoa or brown rice or cardboard is what basically all those taste like. <laughs> or that you had to have, you know, had to be, you know, egg whites and oats for breakfast. No, it doesn't have to be egg whites and oats for breakfast. It doesn't have to be chicken and rice or tilapia and rice every single meal. You can have other foods. That's totally fine. Then... After the 132 pound competition, when we were like, okay, we gotta tighten things up, see what we can do to get down to the 123 class, I sent her the following diet. I do understand that I'm gonna be naming quite a few things with some numbers and stuff, uh, so you might have to kind of rewind <laughs> and redo this, but I do wanna actually give you all of the details so that way you could really get a good picture of it. She trained twice a day. One was in the morning of the day, and I'm going to explain her training here in a second better and more in depth. But the beginning of the day was like 20, 30 minutes, kind of mobility work, get her up and moving. And then the middle of the day was the, the weighted weight training. And the reason why we kind of did it this way is she was already doing that when she came to me. So I was like, okay, well, if you already have that as part of your schedule, cool, let's crush it. The other part was is to do it in the middle of the day all combined would have taken her roughly about an hour and a half, about an hour and 15 to an hour and a half. And that would be very hard to find an hour and a half chunk in the middle of the day. By splitting the workouts up, we had 20 to 30 minutes in the morning, and then the part in the middle of the day could be as short as 40-ish minutes, which is much easier to find in a, a very challenged scheduled day. So you have six kids, brand new business, where in the world are you going to find time, right? She was able to find 40-ish minutes here or there as opposed to having to find an hour and a half, which we know requires actually prep time to get ready for that and then time to come out of that. So it would essentially be like two hours that she would have to carve out in the middle of the day. That's very challenging, much more challenging than just finding 40 minutes. So she trained twice a day before her morning session. We would never work out fasted. Don't do that. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I do have past podcasts that talk about exercising in a fasted state. I have given it to people at specific situations. Uh, so 
I'm not a fan of it, but podcast 882 is a nutrition podcast titled, If I Hate Fasted Exercise, Why Do I Sometimes Prescribe It? (laughs) So I'll give you why I do it sometimes in podcast 882. If you want to find the older podcasts, if your podcast player doesn't go back that far, you can go to our website, www.brutalirongym.com. Scroll down a bit on the homepage is a, a podcast player. And underneath that podcast player are instructions on how to find older podcasts. So podcast 882 talks about if I hate fasted exercise, why do I t- sometimes prescribe it? And then podcast 614 is a nutrition podcast titled The Effects of Caffeine-Fueled Fasted Workouts. Often people take enough caffeine to not notice that they're underfed, uh, but the body knows that, and you get a lot of negative responses. Uh, If you're not taking certain supplements, uh, wink, wink, that can protect against those negative uh, effects, fasted exercise is is kind of a big no-no. Uh, So you can listen to those two podcasts, 882 and 614, to learn more about that. So before her uh, morning workout, I had her consume 8 ounces of orange juice, 3 quarter cup of fat-free Greek yogurt, with 25 grams of vanilla protein powder. Stole this from Stan Efferding, so shout out to Stan Efferding and the Vertical Diet, is he works with a lot of athletes, very high-end level athletes. And one of them, uh, Mitch Hooper, uh, who is the current world's strongest man, was talking about using this shake as a way to get uh, kind of a good influx of uh, protein in. So his portions are definitely different because he's a 300 plus pound, you know, giant man. (laughs) But he was using this drink and credited Stan Efforting for it. And I was like, well, you know, in my world, in my own personal goals, I was actually looking for a way to kind of get up in the morning, get started, and didn't want to be bogged down by like having to prep, prep, meal prep in the mornings. So I actually started doing this. My portions are different. I eat like two and two and one quarter cup of Greek yogurt, still the 25 grams of vanilla protein powder mixed in, and 10 ounces of orange juice. So I adjusted it to where mine is 500 calories with 65 grams of protein. But this is what we did for Lauren and her body size. Eight ounces of orange juice, three quarter cup fat free Greek yogurt, 25 grams of vanilla protein powder. You just put that in a shaker bottle, shake it up, drink it. So she had that before the workout. Then after the workout, she had coffee uh, with some protein added, uh, plus like a little bit of creamer. One slice of Dave's Killer Bread. You can look that up on Amazon and have it sent to you if you want to try that, if you live in a place where you have access to Amazon. And then we had two tablespoons of protein peanut butter. So basically bread with protein peanut butter on it and some coffee. So peanut butter, toast with coffee. She had that after the workout. Then at 10.30 in the morning, another uh, she had a bagel, Dave's Killer Bagel. So that's a a good bagel. Let me look that up actually for you to kind of share some of the ingredients with you. Uh, Dave's Killer Bagel. There we go. Okay. So if we're looking at this, let me pull up the nutrition facts. The ingredients is uh, organic flours. There's a wheat flour, barley flour, rye flour, Uh, spelt flour, millet, quinoa, uh, then all the other things that go into making a bagel, water, yeast, blah, blah, blah. So that is uh, the killer bagel. Now it had 260 calories in it, 3 grams of fat, 48 grams of carbohydrates, and 11 grams of protein. So significantly a carbohydrate source. (laughs) Very significantly a carbohydrate source. Now we had that at 1030, because she was going to be working out at 12.30. So we wanted to get some carbs in. So in the morning, doing the uh, yogurt shake with the orange juice, she's going to be burning up those carbohydrates basically as she works out. And then we're not really putting in a lot of carbohydrates afterwards because she was using the Dave's Killer bread. Uh, So let me show you that one to see how many grams of carbs is in that. So let's look at, uh, okay, so the original, boom, boom. Let's look at the grams of carbs was 21 grams of carbs for one slice. So in her morning shake, she would have been having, uh, let's see, how many grams are in orange juice, orange juice? 
I want to touch on this because people tend to villainize carbohydrates, but they're going to be a huge freaking way for you to actually survive and, and actually have some energy. So in the 8 ounces of orange juice, she would have had uh, 26 grams of carbohydrates. 23 of that is from sugar. So 26 grams of carbohydrates. Then she had the bagel, which we said is around 20-some. And then, I mean, the bread, around 20-some post-workout. And then the bagel, which was around 50 in the mid-morning. So she's already at 100 grams of carbohydrates before we've worked out, like done her heaviest workout of the day. So she did this mobility workout, and then we're leading into the midday. Before uh, her workout, she has a pre-workout drink, which consists of Gatorade powder and then a couple of like basic supplements. And then she had what she called a protein ball, which was um, a little treat that had a little bit of carbs in it, a little bit of protein. Uh, she liked it, and I was like, sure, let's have it. So that was her pre-workout meal. And then after workout was four ounces of a lean meat, which I define as four grams of fat or less per four ounces. Chicken breast is a good example. And then 50 grams of carbohydrates from rice, pasta, or potatoes. She could have a sauce on that for taste, up to 50 calories worth of that sauce. And then we threw in 25 grams of protein powder. Then that's at 2:30. Then at 6:30, she had four ounces of lean meat again, two tablespoons of oil to slow down the digestion of that meat, sauce to taste, and then 25 grams of protein powder. So no carbs in that final meal. So in total, she was drinking around, uh, like eating, consuming around 200 grams of carbs a day, which probably surprises people that you could have that and still cut weight. Yes, you can. Uh, and then for protein, we were consuming uh, at least, let me see here, 25, 50, 75, plus that, so 100, 125, roughly about uh, like body weight, a little over body weight in protein. Uh, and then the remaining calories were uh, like fats, like some fats mixed in there from the oils and whatnot. So that was her meals, was orange juice, Greek yogurt, and vanilla protein powder before her workout. After the workout, some peanut butter toast with coffee. Then somewhere in the middle of the day, a, a bagel. And then before workout, she had a, a Gatorade drink to give her some quick digesting sugars. And then after the workout, we got real strict the rest of the day with uh, lean meat, 50 grams of carbs from rice, pasta, potatoes. And then at the end of the day, four ounces of lean meat, but this time with oils, like so fats instead of carbohydrates. Now... That allowed her to, in the beginning of the day, have a lot of available fuel for the morning workout and the midday workout. And then after the midday workout, we really pulled out the energy components, but made sure we had a lot of protein. This allowed her body to burn any of the excess, if there was any excess, which there wasn't, but if there were excess, you would have burned that off from the morning. And then her body would have been into a, a energy deficit throughout the rest of the day, which would start to strip off body fat. But we kept our protein super high, so that way we would sustain and hold on to muscle tissue and actually still be able to recover and grow and repair from the training. You can build muscle tissue in a caloric deficit. It has to be very controlled in a minor deficit, blah, 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 but it can be done. So we were able to manage her nutrition to where she had great energy for her workouts, but reduced energy intake away from the workouts to promote fat loss. We were able to do that for a couple weeks. Uh, that actually worked out really well. But then her body started kind of fighting us a little bit. We weren't getting uh, as much fat loss as we would like. Uh, I mean, weight loss. We weren't getting as much weight loss as we'd like. If things were starting to kind of plateau. So we're like, okay, what can we do then to kind of push the body to go down? What will sound crazy is I started to do some caloric cycling where I put more carbs in. And what this did in, in like the summary sense is I put more carbohydrates in so that way we could reduce her body feeling that body fat was at risk in a in a simplistic way of saying this is when you try to lose body fat it's best to take the fat off in a manner in which the body is willing to give away the fat 
Body fat is protection for the organs, protection for our body to stay alive. If we run out of energy and we're not eating consistently, our body will say, like basically if you run out of energy, your body dies. So if you run out of like material to produce energy with, whether it's fats, you know, for ketones, you know, carbs for glucose, even protein can be broken down, converted over to glucose. But if you run out of those building blocks of energy, the, the organs can't function. What happens then is if you eat inconsistently, meaning you kind of eat whatever, whenever, the body doesn't know when you're putting energy in. There's no predictability to it. So the body feels at a high degree of risk. Therefore, it's going to retain and hold more body fat. How does it know that? Well, if you have like deficit periods that are very extreme, meaning you you don't like, maybe you don't really eat breakfast, you eat a kind of haphazard lunch, and then you eat at dinner, but the dinner isn't 100% consistent all the time, meaning some days you eat more than you needed, some days you eat less than you needed, some days you eat exactly what you needed, but then you go to bed. Well, the body is processing that food while you're you're sleeping. Some days it's going to process and then be emptied out and then say, oh, geez, you know, we kind of don't have enough energy for what we need to do. Let's tap into body fat storage. So it starts to break down some body fat. Then you wake up, you don't eat enough at breakfast to stop that. The body's like, damn, okay. Uh, we're still, you know, still burning a lot of body fat. Lunch, don't eat enough, still burning a lot of body fat. So then by the time dinner rolls around, your body can sense that a, a significant portion of body fat has been burned off. And then all of a sudden you influx a bunch of, like you intake a bunch of calories, and the body says, oh, hey, you know, we had to burn a lot of body fat. And if we continued at that rate of loss, we would potentially run out of body fat and die. So let's take some of the surplus we have in this moment. Let's replace as much of that body fat as we can. And if it has enough surplus, it'll replace more than what it burned off. So I've talked about this with like a bank account. Is if I'm constantly spending to my paycheck, spend, spend, spend to my paycheck, spend to my paycheck, spend to my paycheck, then all of a sudden an unexpected bill comes through. Maybe you got to replace a water heater. <laughs> you know, maybe your car broke down. And all of a sudden you're in the red. You're in the negative. The next time you get the paycheck, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you don't spend it to the paycheck. You're like, crap, in case that emergency happened again, let me save a couple hundred bucks. So then you save a couple hundred bucks that paycheck, save a couple hundred bucks the next paycheck. Then maybe the emergency doesn't seem so stressful anymore because it's you know, out of sight, out of mind. Some time has passed. So now you start spending towards your paycheck again. And then the next emergency comes. You're like, oh, hey, that was pretty good that I had that savings. I can now spend my savings. But the savings got chewed up, and maybe this expense was bigger than the last one. And you're like, wow, damn. You know, I saved 400 bucks, but I needed 600 Okay, let me go back to saving, but this time I'm not going to stop at 400 I'm going to save 600 But since that happened, maybe I need to save 800 So you save 800 Another emergency rolls around, but before you can save back the money, another emergency rolls around, and the combination of the two emergencies cost you 1000 So now you work to save not just 400 not 800 not 1000 maybe 1200 or 1400 So you can see the approach would be is you felt the stress of overspending, so then when you had the opportunity, you saved what was needed and more for protection. The body does the same thing with calories and body fat. So what was happening with her was we had the body drop some body fat, but then it was grumpy. It was very mad. It didn't like it because it was having to give up body fat. But since she was controlled and consistent every single day, there weren't surpluses to where the body could replace the body fat that was burned off. So what started to happen was the body felt stressed. And when we feel stressed, we produce cortisol. When we produce cortisol, we increase water retention. So although she was continuing to lose body fat, her water retention due to the nutritional stress was increasing. And therefore, on the scale, we saw it stay the same. The scale kind of stayed consistent. And we're like, oh, this is an indicator because we're definitely eating in a caloric deficit. Fat has to be, physiologically, has to be coming off. Why do we not see that in the scale? It's because there's an increase of stress, there's an increase of water retention. 
How do you get rid of water retention? You could force a diuretic. We could be drug tested, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> so it's like, what's the other methods we have? Well, I could reduce the nutritional stress by adding carbohydrates. I'm not going to add so much that it takes us out of a deficit, but I'm going to add enough to reduce the nutritional stress, to reduce cortisol, to reduce water retention. I added carbohydrates, 50 grams of carbohydrates in the middle of the day. We added that to her breakfast in the morning, that Dave's killer bread with the peanut butter, so the peanut butter toast with the coffee. We added 50 grams of carbohydrates right then. So right after her morning workout, right when her body would have been struggling to find energy, we reduced the stress. Within, I think within a day or two, she lost two pounds of water weight. And then we lost an additional pound over the next couple days. So we ended up adding carbohydrates. We added 50 grams of carbohydrates to her breakfast. And she lost three pounds. How in the world can you eat more carbohydrates and lose weight? The reason was we understood what the body was telling us. We understood the condition we were in. And we knew that we weren't losing body weight because the body was too stressed. We had to reduce the stress, not eat so much that it took us out of a deficit, but we had to actually eat more to lose more. Sounds crazy, right? But understanding how the body works allows you to manipulate these moments and still get the outcome you want. So that was the change we made that kind of gave us the last final push was on her training days, we added 50 grams of carbohydrates. Then on non-training days, what were we doing? We actually still had the orange juice, Greek yogurt, and vanilla protein powder in the morning. The reason why is I wanted to get her out of a stressful state, which was the fasted state of sleeping at night. We wanted to give very fast digesting carbohydrates and sugars I mean, I'm sorry, carbohydrates and protein. So that way we could get her out of that stressed state, start putting some energy back into the muscles, start giving the body protein to do more repairs and things that it ran out of protein at night. And then midday in the morning, we had the four ounces of lean meat, 50 grams of carbs from rice, pasta, or potatoes. And again, that's not 50 grams of weight. I'm not talking about weight. So if you're a non-American, <laughs> uh, you would use grams to weigh your food. Uh, we're not talking about weight. I'm talking about so much of the food that it provided 50 grams of carbohydrates in regards to like an energy source. So if you look at the nutrition fact label where it says total fat, total carbs, protein, in the total carb section, we're eating 50 grams of carbohydrates. So the portion would be whatever it led to 50 grams of carbohydrates from the rice, pasta, or potatoes. So again, it's not 50 grams in weight. It's actually the source, the amount of carbohydrates that would have been in it. So four ounces of lean meat, 50 grams of carbohydrates from rice, pasta, potatoes, sauce to taste. The sauce had to stay under 50 calories though, and 25 grams of protein powder. And we actually did that early midday, later midday, and evening. So she had three of those meals, and then in the morning had the orange juice, uh, the Greek yogurt, and protein powder as the shake. So that's, that, that is what we did on non-training days. So this allowed her, you can see there, she had 150, probably 175, 175-ish uh, grams of carbohydrates every single day. And we still stayed at around body weight in grams of protein. And that allowed her to lose the rest of the weight that we needed. She didn't have to avoid all carbohydrates. We actually added more carbohydrates. What allowed her to be successful was that she was consistent. Initially, we were consistent with that 1,800 to 2,000 calories a day for training days, 1,400 to 1,800 calories on non-training days, one gram per pound of body weight, and then under 80 grams of sugar. That was the diet that we started with. If you notice, there was less specifics there. Uh, we didn't talk about lean meats, didn't talk about specific carb sources, uh, but it allowed us to make great progress. When we wanted to push for progress, what did we do? We tightened things down in the sense that I gave her a specific breakfast, the orange juice, Greek yogurt, and protein powder, because I wanted a specific response from breakfast. Could we have used a different type of sugar source? Yeah. Could we have used a different type of protein source? Yeah. But... This was what I wanted <laughs> uh, because 
I, I've personally had experience with that meal, and I knew that it was going to give her quick, but not too quick digesting protein and sugars, meaning it would have gone into her system fast, but it wouldn't have caused like digestive dumping, which means uh, like uh, a release of too much water into the bowels, and then she would have had diarrhea. So I wanted her to have fast digesting carbs and protein, but not so fast that she wasn't going to have a good workout because she was in the bathroom. So we had to control that. Then the rest of the day, it was just a four ounces of a lean meat. She could have any meat she wanted. And 50 grams of carbs from rice, pasta, potatoes. She could have potatoes. She could have rice. She could have pasta. It wouldn't have mattered. She could have any sauce she wanted as long as it stayed under 50 grams of uh, 50 calories. So you can see that it was actually allowed for a lot of variety. It wasn't, you know, six egg whites, two whole eggs, and a cup of oats. You don't have to do that. You can mix it up. You can eat different foods. So it's pretty cool to see that although there were specifics, there were still variety allowed. She was still able to choose the foods that she preferred that matched her taste preferences as long as it matched the digestive timing that we needed. So that's what we did for nutrition. Then for training, I want to touch on that a little bit. More so just talk about the, the, the general structure and exercise selection so that way you could see kind of our, our overall approach in training. So the program that we used, kind of the month leading into the competition, we, we worked out in the morning on Mondays. We did some mobility work, so a glute stretch followed by some glute-specific exercises, like just bodyweight exercises. And then, uh, so for example, a cross-legged glute stretch is just a, a stretch to open up the um, glute muscles, which is really good for preventing sciatica, and then also loosening the tension on the lower back. So cross-legged glute stretch, you can find that actually on YouTube. If you search Brutal Iron Gym cross-legged glute stretch, you'll see me teaching it. <laughs> uh, and then we had a quadruped position so on your hands and knees she had to do uh, hip circles which is basically picking up your leg and kind of doing circles with it to open up the hips and then a glute, glute crossover uh, which is basically you extend your leg behind you and you kind of cross it over the other leg back and forth back and forth so just a nice load on the like glute tension but it's just body weight and then we had planks where we did alternating leg lifts in the plank position from the elbows. So not planks from your hands, plank from your elbows. And she lift one leg, then the other leg, one leg, then the other leg. So that's really good for core and for glute work and hip positioning. We then did uh, banded distraction and mobilization drills for the hips. Uh, that would have been you know about 10-ish minutes, maybe five, five, six, six minutes there. And then we did seven minutes on her Concept 2 Bike Erg, where we did three minutes of a sit-down speed, and then 30 seconds of a sprint, back to three minutes of sit-down, then a 30-second sprint, and done. So that was it. So four exercises for the glutes and planks, and then some band mobilization drills, and then the seven minutes on the Concept 2 bike. I mean, we're talking about 20 minutes right there. Then later in the day, we did our, our major squat session. We would do leaning, cause over, leaning over Cossack squats, which is just a way to open up the adductors, basically. Uh, a deep squat to help open up the adductors again, uh, try to work on like opening up the glute muscles, getting that nice deep position. She would hold that for 20 seconds. We did bodyweight squats where you put your elbows against your knees and you kind of mimic a full leg extension. That, again, is to open up the hamstrings and adductors. Then we did power lunge jumps, which would be just to kind of open up all those muscles, get a contractile firing phase, uh, meaning getting the tissue ready to contract 100% like snap, boom, boom, boom. So that way we would have that excitement for the contracting uh, that we would need in the squats. And then she warmed up the squats. So that was it. She did those three rounds of those things with the first three warm-up sets of squats. In squats, we worked up to a couple sets. So she had four sets of two reps in week one at progressive heavy, heavier weights. We never lifted more than 90% in, in week one. In week two, we got up close to 90% for two sets of two. Week three, again, we got around 90%, maybe a smidge over like 91, 92%, two sets of one. Then week four, I had to work up to 95% for two singles. But it was like, one set of two, one set of two, one set of two, one set of two. 
The next week was one set of two, one set of two, then two sets of two as a top weight. The following week again, one set of two, one set of two, then two sets of one at a top weight. And then the fourth week was a one set of two, one set of one, then two sets of one. The reason why I'm saying that, you don't know the weights, but it wasn't five by five. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, three sets of eight or three sets of six. It wasn't even sets of three. We did doubles, doubles and singles. The reason why was we were uh, within a month, like within four weeks of the meet. At this point, we are refining technique for the meet. The meet is singles. You do singles in front of the judges. What often happens when people do multiple rep sets, the first rep is trash. They fix their positioning based on how the first rep felt. The second rep gets better. Maybe the third rep is the best. And then from there, it's kind of a hodgepodge mess. (laughs) But typically, people are used to the first rep giving them feedback and the second rep being better. You don't get to do that in a powerlifting meet. You only get one rep at a powerlifting meet. One attempt. Like one rep per attempt. So it's important to practice singles so you don't get lazy with the first rep of a multiple rep set. I wanted her to do singles so she was forced to get it right. You you literally have to be right once. <laughs> you don't get to feel out the first rep and then adjust on the second rep. And this is something I'll see very often in social media posts when people will show multiple rep sets. The first rep, they're out of position. The second rep, they're much cleaner. We have to be very careful of relying on that because at a powerful meet, you do not get to do that. So therefore, you have to practice without that. So she was doing singles uh, on her tap end sets. And then we also did walkout holds. So we would load up to uh, what her one rep max would be or even above that, up to like 10% above. She would unrack it, step back, stand in position for 10 seconds, walk it back in and rack it. That is a great job on the CNS is if you can get lift, like say your max is 315, but you unrack and hold 345. Your 315 is going to feel a lot easier now. (laughs) You have to get the body used to heavy weight loads. If you only ever feel the heaviest weight load ever on max effort singles or at competitions, that's not enough to overcome the anxiety, the fear, the pressure that you feel in that moment. So you want to acclimate yourself to fear. (laughs) So that way, when you unrack it in in the meat, you're like, oh, this again. (laughs) Oh, I've felt this before. That's the feeling you want. Uh, Jennifer Thompson, who arguably is the best, she's the goat of female power fears for sure. Uh, She does lockout holds and heavy lockout holds for bench and squats all the time. Uh, She even does rack elevated rack pulls uh, for deadlifts. She's a big proponent of that and it absolutely has paid off. Uh, I think she won like um, like national level competition uh, 10 years in a row. She's a badass. So if you don't know who Jennifer Thompson is, you should. And go find her on social media. Uh, tons and tons and tons of great knowledge that she shares for free on Instagram. I follow her on Instagram. We've actually hosted uh, her and some other female powerlifters teaching clinics at the gym a couple of years. It's an awesome, awesome experience. So great wealth of knowledge. I've gotten to go lift with her. Great human being as well. So excellent information. And she uses these kind of uh, lockout holds and, and uh, kind of top and heavy uh, extremes to help push her CNS. I first learned of it by Josh Bryant. Uh, so if you don't know who he is, go look him up. <laughs> He's uh, His name is Jailhouse Strong on Instagram and YouTube. But Josh Bryant is B-R-Y-A-N-T. And you'll see him when you see him. <laughs> Clearly a strength-based guy. Uh, but I learned about that from him. And it was great information, really helped uh, overload and push the CNS. So I do a lot of reverse band benching, a lot of lockout holds, especially for my female lifters, because it really helps overload the connective tissues and helps to push their body to adapt uh, faster than if they don't do those techniques. Then after her squats, we did have some higher rep sets. We had a couple sets of six, a couple sets of five, a couple sets of four over the weeks. And that's just to get some good volume in to push the connective tissues and muscle tissues to continue to grow and adapt. And then we had bodyweight Cossack squats, which is the little nitty gritty weird stuff that work around the groin and the hips. She was able to do that after squats. So that was her workout in the middle of the day. It is a movement prep circuit that takes less than 10 minutes. 
the actual main lift, which would take roughly about 20 to 30 minutes, uh, at, at, well, probably like more on the 20 end, and then a little quick circuit at the end, which then takes up the rest of it. So uh, it takes in total about 40 minutes if you follow the rest periods that I have listed. If they extend the rest periods a little bit, <laughs> it's going to take closer to an hour. But in total per day, in the morning session and the midday session, she was spending about an hour to an hour and a half. But we broke it up because we said it's hard to find an hour and a half in the middle in one chunk. So we had the mobility chunk in the morning and then midday had the heaviest weight load. Then Tuesday, same thing. Uh, the morning session for mobility and cardio, then the midday heavy weights. And then we took Wednesday off, but I asked her, hey, make sure you get out and go walk for 20 minutes just to help with uh, blood flow, help with digestion, help with movement, helps reduce water retention, helps with a lot of good stuff. Uh, then on Thursday, we did again, did again the, the morning session, then the midday session, Friday morning session, midday session, then Saturday and Sunday off, be active, you know, do normal things, uh, don't cause extra damage to the tissues, we need to have them recover, but that's it. So in her training, it was the equivalent of four one and a half hour workouts a week. That's it. She spent in total an hour and a half per day in the gym, four days a week. We did movement preparation at the beginning, about 10 minutes of movement prep. Then we did our main heavy lift and then a couple accessories afterwards to push some connective tissue and muscle tissue adaptation. Uh, and that's it. That's, that's all it takes. Like it's, it, it wasn't three hours in the gym, you know, every day. It wasn't training seven days a week or even six days a week, or even five days a week. It was four, four days a week of an hour and a half of training. That's it. This is what she did to achieve three elite totals in six months while losing 20 pounds. She paid attention to the consistency of calories per day. At first, we did a range so the 1,800 to 2,000 calories on training days, 1,400 to 1,800 on non-training days. What's important to note there is it's a range. She didn't have to hit a specific number every single day. That's impossible for a long period of time. <laughs> uh, then she had protein, again, a range around her body weight. And then the timing of those things was pretty well spread out throughout the day. When we got to the nitty-gritty of the details, we still would have had a variableness to her calories because it was open to the meats being a little bit different. The sauces could be a little bit different. Remember, she had up to a 50 calorie allowance. So there could have been 100, maybe 150 calorie difference every day, even though the foods were more specific. So we also had allowance for different types of meats, different types of carbohydrates, different types of sauces. So she had variety within her foods, even when we were in the nitty gritty of the details. What helped her was she was consistent. Every day, she hit the targets. Every day, she ate foods that matched her digestive needs. Faster digesting foods before workouts, slower digesting foods away from workouts. She ate foods that digested well. She ate foods that she liked. She ate foods that were easy for her to prepare and have ready label. So that way she could be consistent with them. And then training... To achieve three elite totals was four one and a half hour workouts a week. That's it. What helps is when every effort you take is intentionally, precisely to your goal. There were no wasted efforts. That's the key. Whether you have a coach whether you follow a really damn good program, however you get one, <laughs> that's the key. Is if the approach is concise and correct for your needs, your goals, who you are as an individual. If you can refine it so well that there are no wasted efforts. It doesn't take as much effort as you probably thought. Again, there were no secrets. There wasn't a crazy amount of time needed per day, and things didn't have to be perfect. In Lauren's example, six kids, brand new business along the, pro along the way, certainly things weren't going to be perfect. In your world, you might have a couple kids, you might have no kids. 
You might be starting a new business. You might not be starting a business. But undoubtedly, you have things that are stress in your life. You have things that that push you out of your normal routine. You are going to struggle with things not being perfect. That's okay. The things that we think have to be perfect probably don't. The things that we think we're getting wrong, we're probably not. (laughs) And what I mean by that is... Our calories can be within a range. Our protein can be within a range. The actual specific foods you have can be within a range. In Lauren's example, pasta, potatoes, rice. I could care less which of those she chose. I've encouraged clients whenever they thought they screwed up. I remember one client, I've told this before, but it's a nice, quick, easy example. Uh, She told me she was really mad at herself. She messed up. She had pizza for dinner. Well, when I stopped her and we talked about what she would normally have for dinner, how many calories it should have, how much protein it should have, we found out that the slice of pizza actually was okay and she underate. She actually didn't have enough food. So she ate a piece of pizza thinking that she wrecked her whole damn day, like was super discouraged, and we found out that she actually didn't eat enough. (laughs) So people sometimes get too narrow-minded with specifics of foods, and that actually isn't entirely necessary. What's more important is the calories and the protein of those foods and when we have them, the timing. So I hope this uh, lifted the veil in some ways for what it takes to achieve such an amazing accomplishment. So congratulations, Lauren. Freaking 100% total badass effort. Again, on Instagram, you can find her under Rutan422, TikTok, StrongMom422, and you can visit their athletic club uh, online at www.rutanathleticclub.com. You can learn more about her and see kind of her journey. But she was able to achieve it. I've had actually another client, uh, one of my best friends, Paul. He has six daughters, and he has competed twice in uh, men's physique shows. (laughs) <laughs> so there's a theme going here with six, six kids. But you can do amazing, wonderful, crazy, awesome, mind-blowing, life-changing things if you're concise in what you're doing to make sure that the, the only efforts you're putting in are getting you the best outcome possible so that way you don't have to do too much to just get what the middle percentage of what you're doing is do, getting you. So make sure what you're doing is 100% concise to your individual goals, your individual needs for who you are as a person individual approach that will make sure that whatever effort you do gets you 100% something awesome out of it and then you just have to be consistent as I said earlier if you run into an obstacle don't stop oh you know I'd love to be able to lose more weight but oh you know I'm really challenged with my job being 12 hours okay well what can you do around that what are you doing with the other 12 hours a day And I'm not saying be hardcore and give up sleep. Sleep is super important. I'm not saying be hardcore and give up relationships. Relationships are super important. What I'm saying is, is just streamline your day. You know, if you're spending an hour and a half watching TV, could you spend 20 minutes of that on a treadmill while watching TV or an elliptical while watching TV? Figure out ways to just refine what you do. Do not be all hardcore. You don't have to give up your whole life to achieve great things. But you have, to, you have to put some effort in. You have to do some things that are uncomfortable. You have to do some things that are, that are not as fun as eating whatever the hell you want and laying on the couch all day, right? We know that in life. <laughs> uh, we, we have to go to work because we need to pay bills. Uh, so there's a lot of things in life that we do that, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy some of my life, but I know i got to fit this in if I want to achieve what I want. That's all it takes is just, okay, I want to enjoy my life, but i got to fit this in. We have to be a little more willing to, quote-unquote, fit this in. How we do that is to increase our stress margin and better manage our time. Those are two components. I would say the stress thing is the biggest. The reason why we often don't take on the necessary things to achieve great goals is because we're overburdened, we're overstressed already. We can't add more when we're already stressed. So I want to give you a couple podcasts that will help you learn how to manage stress better. Okay? Uh, let's see here. Um, boop, 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 boop. We have a lot of podcasts on stress, so <laughs> I want to try to figure out uh, a couple good ones. So podcast 1547 
would be a good podcast. It's a mindset podcast that will minimize stress by doing the minimum. Uh, there's, actually, there's actually a way you can kind of cover all goals by just doing a baseline minimum. And that, that podcast will teach you how to do that. And then podcast 1,346 is a mindset podcast titled Mental Management When Stressed. So that'll be a really good podcast as well to learn how to just manage life when you're in a stressed state. So podcast 1,547, podcast 1,346. All of this information in today's podcast, because I know it's a long one. Let's see here. We're already over an hour. It's a long one. But I wanted to share it because Lauren's accomplishment is amazing. But I want you to see, it doesn't take what we traditionally associate as amazing. Meaning crazy sacrifices, spending all day in the gym and eating horrible, boring food. What it does take is a sustained energy and effort consistently. That's it. Just consistency. That's the thing. That's the key. If you're consistent, you can achieve great things. So focus on how to be more consistent. And you can achieve great things. Thank you, Lauren, for showing us what's possible. Thank you to all my clients who listen to things I tell you (laughs) so we can crush amazing things and I get to have the fun of making awesome podcasts like this. So thank you to everybody who works with me. I greatly appreciate it. Again, congratulations to Lauren. And for all the listeners, if you have any questions, if you need anything, go to the website, www.brutalirongym.com. You can go to the bottom of the homepage. There's a contact form. You can contact me for anything you need. Also, you can check out our one-on-one services page to learn about the different types of services we offer. Uh, There's just a ton of free information on the website as well if you want to check that out. If you like the podcast, please share the podcast. The more people we share the podcast with, the more people we can help. I would love to get the messages that are shared in the podcast out into the world for more people to learn from that and to just have healthier and happier lives. So please, if you don't mind, please share the podcast in conversation with people on social media pages. However you do it, I appreciate that you do it and hopefully they will as well. If you like the podcast, you can also consider donating to support the podcast financially, which you can do on the website. And if you like the information we share in the podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels. You can find us and follow us on Instagram and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Gym. If you do check those out, make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow so we can build the platform so again we can reach more people and help more people. As always, I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.